Hello students, welcome to EPG Patashala. I am K. Murlidhar from South Asian University where I am an honorary professor. I retired from Delhi University. Today we are going to discuss about a module understanding living organisms and the living state. The objectives of this module are after studying this module you shall be able to appreciate the origins, width and depth of biology. Realize the fact that there is no one definition by which a living organism can be recognized and also identify the different aspects of biology which leads to biophysics. Further, evaluate the validity of ideas and techniques to give rise to correct knowledge and analyze any area of biology and distinguish tangible phenomenon which can be measured by physics, physicochemical techniques and intangible concepts, oblique ideas which are not amenable to measurement but which is also part of biology. Biology is the science of life. Life includes the living organisms, the living processes and the living state. Physics, chemistry and biology are the three pillars of natural science. Natural science has the sole aim of understanding the structure and function of nature that is this material world. The physical aspects of this universe in terms of measurable variables like volume, voltage, pressure, velocity etc. are not only estimated but their interdependence is also discovered by physics. The interdependence is expressed in mathematical language in the form of laws of universe, for example, laws of thermodynamics, laws of mechanics, etc. Physics believes that this universe, read it another name, nature, to be real and that natural phenomena strictly follow certain behavioral patterns discovered and expressed in as universal laws. The most important lesson we learn from physics is that matter and energy are two sides of the same coin and that all forms of energy or fields are manifestation of a single unified field or energy form. The biggest mystery to be decoded in physics is the creation of universe that is creation of mass from nothing. Chemistry on the other hand believes that the universe is made from a finite number of immutable elements, for example gold, copper, hydrogen, carbon etc. The diversity of objects or substances in our universe is a mirage and there are only finite number of elements which comprise this infinite number of objects or substances. While the physical and chemical worlds were described and understood by physicists and chemists respectively, the living world of animals, plants and microbes was not investigated through experiments for many centuries till the middle of the 17th century. Francis Bacon, René Descartes and Karl Popper are some of the great philosophers of science who have defined science in the modern sense in both the, of the both process by which knowledge is acquired and also the knowledge generated by that process which is popularly called as scientific method. Uh, this uh, paper is about introducing biology to biophysics students. So we should understand first of all where does biology map under science? For that we should understand what is the nature of science. Scientific theories are based on analysis of carefully collected experimental data 
which means measurement of something or the other. And this science essentially started during Renaissance period in Europe around 14th, 15th century. Because of three great people, Francis Bacon, René Descartes and Karl Popper in recent times, we now understand what is this nature of science. Now this science is essentially about measuring and understanding the structure and functioning of nature. And this has three components, physics, chemistry and biology. Physics makes measurement of what they call as operational concepts and as a result of which we have lot of data which they try to understand by setting up relationship among these collected data and give a description of the physical nature of this world. Although the scientific inquiry was there in many civilizations, science in the modern sense we understood only from the 14th, 15th century. Therefore, it is a colonial legacy that we got it through colonial rule. In fact, to be very frank, the correct definition of science came hardly 180 years back. In 1831, the British Association of Advancement of Science coined the term science in the modern sense. Curiosity and a desire to understand and explain the world of experience is scientific spirit. We notice what is the nature of science. One should remember that science is about measurement. Without measurement, there is no science. And this science is understanding about nature, the structure and functioning, and it is done in three approaches. The first is called physics. Physics measures operational concepts and hence tries to explain the physical reality of this universe. Two, chemistry, which deals with the chemical nature of this universe and chemists relate structure to function or activity. The third component deals with living organisms and in fact this was studied by default as both the physics and chemistry people were not interested in this for a long time because they came under influence of the church and the biblical sayings which said that God's creation cannot be experimented with. However, slowly people started biology and it, in the initial phase it was only description, there was no measurement in the true sense of science. Therefore, if you look at uh, biology as opposed to physics and chemistry where from the beginning there was experimentation and therefore it was an experimental science, biology started and ended in three phases. Phase 1 essentially, so we call this as growth of biological thought and phase 1 essentially was descriptive. It is also called as phenomenological biology based on observations. How do you make observations? Observations are made with your eyes or later magnifying lens or later with a microscope. There was no question to ask and therefore it was called as classical biology and it resulted in natural history of all the living organisms on this earth. What happened was as a result of such observational undertaking, catalogues and classification of organisms, taxonomy and such areas were developed and this went on till middle of the 19th century. At that point, Darwinian ideas came and that changed the picture of biology. In this Phase 1, as I said, it is only pure description of living organisms, where do they exist, what are their sizes, what do they do, all sorts of things based on purely observations. And here you have some representative examples like this is uh, Asian elephant. Later we will refer to this as one of the endangered species. This is a representative of a big group of animals called birds. These are also technically called as yaves. These are given only as representative examples to tell you that there is a tremendous biodiversity of which we will talk and discuss much later. As I mentioned, this study of organisms by purely observation ended up having catalogs but never led to any understanding. 
because nobody asked a question and nobody therefore gave any answers. However, as mentioned earlier, the first and the greatest concept in biology came in the middle of the 19th century and two people are given credit for that, Wallace and Charles Darwin. And these ideas are summarized as origin of life and evolution by natural selection. In support of this, that this became essentially a paradigm in biology for the classical biology, we see statements by very big thinkers like Francis Crick who said that biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved. And therefore, biologists indulged in this so-called phenomenological description and even after Darwin's ideas came, instead of answering what is the mechanism of evolution, this biology was hijacked to answer the following questions. What are the proximate causes for physiological and behavioral processes? And what is the ultimate cause for ecological or biological phenomena, including evolution? Was, as I mentioned earlier, the classical phase was essentially descriptive. However, around 17th century, there was a French mathematician called René Descartes and because of his influence, he is also the first philosopher of science and a self-styled biologist. There was a new phase of biology called reductionist biology. This is essentially largely influenced by René Descartes and his ideas. It is experimental and as instructed by him, people started using the concepts and techniques of physics and chemistry and applied it to biology and therefore we popularly say that biology can be reduced to physics and chemistry and hence it is called reductionist biology. This phase believes that understanding the components of a system leads to understanding of the whole system. This is the most dominant and visible phase of biology today. It does not explain emergent properties, characteristics of biology. We will see some examples of these reductionist biologists and what they do. Reductionist biology essentially looks for phenomena exhibited by living organisms like describing their life cycles as it is shown here. There are many types of life cycles. Every organism is born and then someday it dies. Death is an obligatory end of all living processes. And these life cycles were of different types as described in this slide shown here. Some of them have a different stage called larva, which is not found in every type of organism. You see them in insects and you see them in what are called as amphibians or frogs in a popular terminology. Now, the most fundamental thing in biology is to define what is living organism. And we can see there are three ways of defining this. One of them is listed here as a chemical definition. This says that living organisms are made of chemical compounds of carbon and other atoms and that these chemicals are constantly exhibiting chemical reactions or undergoing chemical reactions and the sum total of these reactions is termed as metabolism and that anything that exhibits metabolism should be called as a living organisms and therefore metabolism becomes the chemical definition of what is living. Gives you examples of different life cycles of another big group of organisms which we popularly called as plants. In fact, plants themselves are divided into a number of groups. We will not go into detail about all this. Starting from unicellular plants like Chlamydomonas and others, all the way through algae, fungi, gymnosperms and finally the flowering plants. All these are described and each one of them have a life cycle. In general, if you look at this slide, you will notice that there are two phases in the life cycle of any plant from any group of plants. One is called the sporophytic phase, another is called the gametophytic phase. As we progress from unicellular plants like Chlamydomonas, all the way up to flowering plants, we see the predominance of the gametophytic phase in the initial stages and subsequently the sporophytic phase. In fact, in the initial stages, gametes which are haploid organisms are formed from another 
gametophytic cell only by simple mitotic division. Whereas as you go higher and higher plants, this so-called haploid cells are formed from diploid cells by meiotic division. Therefore, we understand that the phase 2 of biology or growth of biological thought essentially dealt with what we call now as reductionist biology, which gave us mechanisms underlying all living processes which are clubbed together as physiology or behavior. Now, in spite of the claim that reductionist biology as opposed to classical biology essentially says that it understands biology, we now realize that reductionist biology also does not lead to any understanding as it only deals with proximate cause and effect relationship and understanding is lacking in this. It is also descriptive like the phase 1 biology except that the language is different. In phase 1 biology, the description was in morphological terms while in phase 2 reductionist biology, the description is in molecular language and therefore, a third phase of biology started few years back, two, three decades back, largely due to computational use in this biology, where people believed that you will never understand the functioning of the whole and emergent properties by merely describing the parts. And therefore, this phase is called as in silico biology, as is shown here. And it believes that interactions among the components of a system leads to emergent properties of the whole organism, largely practiced through simulations done with computers. To put it in crude language, in mathematics, 2 plus 2 is 4, while in biology, 2 plus 2 is 5. And that extra is called the emergent property. And this came to be understood not by classical biology, not by reductionist biology, but only by what we call as computational biology, or systems biology or in silico biology. Let us therefore understand that the three phases of biology gave us a huge body of knowledge or information about biological systems and therefore when students learn biology, they learn different branches of biology. Let us see how the information under biology is organized and presented as different branches. For example, the description of morphological properties and describing the similarities and dissimilarities of different among the different organisms and how to group them and classify them and give them names is called taxonomy. Similarly, what they do, what do they do? They grow, they reproduce, they behave. All this is studied under physiology or what we call as behavior. In addition, these organisms interact among themselves in groups called as populations or among others, other groups and also with the physical habitat and this part of the biology is called as ecology. We will see some details about it in the next modules. Therefore, biology has a large number of branches like environmental biology, reproductive biology, neurobiology, ecological biology, biology and so on and so forth. And that is the reason why the understanding of biology becomes more and more difficult if it is presented only as a subdomain of knowledge and not presented as an integrated biology. As an example to understand different branches, let us look at uh, genetics. Genetics is a branch of biology which deals with how so-called phenotypic characteristics of parents are found inherited in the offspring. And the first person who did experimental observations and came up with some idea was Gregor Mendel during the middle of the 19th century. And this is called as loss of Mendel's or Mendel's loss of inheritance, which we will not go into detail deals essentially another process which all living organisms exhibit is called reproduction. Now this reproduction occurs essentially by two mechanisms or means. One is called as asexual reproduction which is demonstrated or exhibited by a large group of organisms. However, higher plants and higher animals exhibit what we call as 
sexual mode of reproduction. While we will not go into details about the methodology behind this and the information about it, one fact that all of us should remember is sex is also determined or gender is determined by certain physiological mechanisms. However, there are exceptional organisms which will start as one sex but during the course of their life cycle they change the sex and an example is given in this slide where you are seeing a slipper shell Crepidula formicata which begins as a male and then becomes female. Many fish also exhibit same property. Therefore, to really understand biology, we should say biology is knowledge about living organisms and living processes. However, before we go into detail, we should understand what is a living organism. And as we will see in the next 2-3 minutes that we do not seem to understand how to tell precisely what is a living organism. There are different ways of telling what is a living organism. We will look at it one by one. In general, if you look at any uneducated person or a villager or somebody who has not gone to school, they will say that a living organism is something that responds to a stimulus. And that is why a cockroach or a snake will be called as a living organism, whereas trees will not be called anything because even if you kick a tree, it won't respond. Therefore, biological definitions in the primitive era does not tell us precisely what exactly is a living organism. However, we will remember that living organisms biologically respond to environmental stimulus in a little more technical terminology and that is a good definition of living organisms. Therefore, if you look at biological definitions of living organism, we will get two, three versions of it. And the best version is that biological systems grow, reproduce and respond to environmental stimuli. And that is what is always given in school textbooks on biology. However, we notice that this is not a comprehensive definition because after puberty, we stop growing. And therefore, we don't say that after puberty, we are a dead organism. We are still living. Similarly, a plant, a green plant or a tree continues to grow till death and therefore growth becomes a property, definable property for plant systems. Similarly, if you take reproduction as a characteristic, biological characteristic of all organisms, we notice that there are many unfortunate human beings, couples who don't have children. At that point, we can't say that they are not living organisms. So, reproduction is only a property of biological systems, but not necessarily a defining property. And the same thing holds for growth. And therefore, the only biological definition that uh, stands universal is the ability of living organisms to respond to environment. We can put this in another word that biological organisms are aware of their surroundings. In higher organisms, we call this consciousness. We will come back to this little later. As I said earlier, we can also have another definition of living state or living organism and that is a physical state or a physical definition. In this, we believe that all objects in nature follow the laws of physics including the living organisms and the fundamental laws of thermodynamics essentially tell us the behavior of organisms. All objects in nature, including living organisms, move from high energy to low energy and the lowest energy are where it is called as also as an equilibrium. This energy that we talk about consists of two components. One is called useful energy, which can be translated as work, otherwise called as free energy and the other which is called useless energy, otherwise called as entropy. Therefore, all systems move from high energy to low energy. If you apply this to living organisms, death is equivalent to equilibrium because delta G, which is a symbol for free energy for a dead state or a dead animal is zero because everybody knows that dead animals don't work voluntarily. And therefore, living state is defined from a physics perspective as a non-equilibrium steady state 
विच जनरेट एनर्जी स्टोर एनर्जी एंड यूटिलइज द एनर्जी टू रिमेन इन दट स्टेट एंड लिविंग इज नथिंग बट प्रिवेन्शन ऑफ फॉलोइंग इन टू इक्वलिब्रियम विच इज अ नैचुरल ला और अ नैचुरल इंस्टिंक्ट ऑफ आल आबजेक्ट इन लाइफ एंड वन वी रीच दट ईक्वलिब्रियम इट इज अदरव कॉल्ड एस डेथ सो द केमिस्ट्री पीपल also analyzed living systems and came up with chemical definition of living organisms for example if you look at briefly history of chemistry it was started as inorganic chemistry describing the salts elements and compounds inorganic compounds available on this earth subsequently something happened that they asked a simple question these living organisms do they have anything in their system inside they did the chemical analysis and realized that they all have compounds of carbon much more than inorganic compounds and therefore this became known as natural products chemistry in uh, history of chemistry at that point after describing they wanted to know whether these compounds have any role and can we synthesize them but nobody attempted this except in the beginning of the 19th century when frederick oller synthesized urea which is a component of biological systems starting with an inorganic compound like silver isocyanate or ammonium chloride as is shown here and this essentially brought a conceptual paradigm shift in biology that chemical compounds organic compounds present inside living organisms are also we are capable of synthesizing them as shown by oller subsequently many organic chemists synthesized the increasingly complex chemical compounds that we come across in living systems once the chemists described the structure of all the organic compounds and synthesized them also they asked then the most important question what do these compounds do inside a living organism and this breed of chemists called themselves as biochemists and the major discovery they made was that these chemical compounds inside living organisms are not static they are constantly undergoing reactions and the total sum total of all the chemical reactions inside a living organism is called metabolism slide number 26 tells you about some details about this metabolism of different varieties of organic compounds that are found within living systems starting with the diet which enters from outside how these have containing amino acids proteins or nucleic acids or carbohydrates and what kind of reactions they undergo is briefly listed in slide number 26 additional examples of these complex metabolic reactions that constantly occur within living organisms is shown here this is a classical what is called as a tricarboxylic acid cycle or tca cycle sir hans krebs got nobel prize for discovering the different reactions of this as is shown here it is an example of a metabolic pathway which is a group of metabolic reactions which occur continuously but the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction and therefore we call it as metabolite flux and this happens in a circular fashion as indicated here says that if you translate all these metabolic reactions and metabolic pathways from test tube experiments to live organisms especially in a higher organism we notice that essentially this is what is described by physiologists as tissue metabolism here is shown an example of a liver an intestine and a kidney how they are related to each other by their metabolic profiles you notice here another branch of metabolism how organisms excrete their nitrogenous compounds there are three types of organisms those who live in water they are called aquatic organisms and they excrete nitrogen in the form of ammonia because it goes out in the water however terrestrial organisms do not get so much water and therefore they convert this ammonia into a compound called urea and mostly especially human beings excrete this urea in their urine every day 
an average human being excretes 30 grams of urea. This slide will tell you how this urea is synthesized starting from ammonia and carbon dioxide with the help of some energy input in the form of ATP. Although we have earlier described three definitions, physical definition, chemical definition, biological definition, we notice that still we are not very clear how to talk about a brain dead patient available in many hospitals where you notice that the family is surrounding this patient but the patient is not aware of his family because there is no consciousness. His brain is dead. Now comes a very crucial juncture. Shall we call this person as dead or living? The medical profession will call them as clinically dead person but the family and the social system does not recognize them as dead because they still believe as they are breathing and heart is beating although they are maintained by heart lung machines they still consider emotionally attached to them and therefore they consider as living and therefore we come to this peculiar situation where three to four hundred years of biological study we are not able to clearly define what is a living organism therefore summarizes conceptually the entire biology this is given by American US Academy and these are called as four paradigms of biology and this essentially says that in biological systems structure at the anatomical level at the molecular level at the cellular level subserves function and that essentially explains not only inheritance but also environmental influence. I will change this here a little bit. A second paradigm is organisms interact among themselves and with environment and vice versa. The third paradigm of biology is that the flow of genetic information through generations explains inheritance and environmental influence through mutations. And the fourth and the last definition or the paradigm in biology is that all biological systems essentially exhibit evolve evolution because what is constant about biological system is change. There is no organism which remains same throughout centuries. Even human beings are evolving. Only thing what you notice now is more cultural evolution than what we call biological evolution. So students, let us summarize what we have learnt in this lesson. Biology is the study of living organisms, both their structure and their function. It can be studied only through physics and chemistry. Mere description without doing any, without asking any question of how and why this descriptive biology or it forms otherwise is called as natural history. Mechanisms underlying living processes are given under physiology or behavior. The explanation of all living processes and ecological phenomena are given through Darwinian ideas of organic evolution by natural selection. Biochemistry and biophysics have led to great clarity in understanding biology besides bringing experimentation and investigation, the hallmark of science. Evolution is the most important concept in human history and still inspires awe in our understanding, but we understand very little about that evolution. It is very difficult to precisely define what is a living organism or a living state. Human biology is the frontier of biology but while analyzing which leads to questions in uh, psychology, philosophy and sociology. Biology therefore is the most integrated of all the sciences and interdisciplinary in nature to the highest degree. Thank you.